Okay, um, welcome everyone to the next uh, part of the CCSE conversation series. Um, today, um, we're going to be focusing on the topic of culture, festivity and creative placemaking, COVID-19 and beyond. Um, I've got two speakers with me today um, to discuss this issue. First, we've got uh, Graham Ross. Graham Ross is a, a Glasgow-based architect, urban designer and planner, uh, executive director of Austin Smith Lord, um, who's been with since 1998, and he's led a variety of projects across the UK and Ireland. Some of those current projects include your city centre district regeneration frameworks uh, in Glasgow for Glasgow City Council, um, GSE Outer Space for Glasgow Science Centre, which is relevant to the discussions we're going to have, work in Helens, but in AIR, roundabout streetscapes, regeneration and public realm development, uh, and also project a town hall for all, which is a community-led project for young people in Penny Cook, which is featured in the Happenstance, which is Scotland's contribution to the Venice um, Architecture Biennale in 2018. Graham's led over a dozen Scottish government-funded design charrettes and numerous community-led participatory planning projects in place across Scotland. Uh, and he's also an associate director of uh, a project that I lead, which is the HERA-funded research called Festspace, um, which includes four other European universities within that project. Uh, secondly, I've got uh, Peter McCaughey, who's the lead artist at Wave Particle. Peter's curated and delivered artworks for temporary installations and permanent commissions, as well as leaning on community animation, placemaking, and master planning projects across the UK. Um, over the last few years, Wave Particle's worked all across Scotland, delivering over 20 government supported planning charrettes, so there's relevance to what Graham does in that space too. Um, and Peter's own uh, independent self-directed practice includes Cultural Hijack. He's also the lead artist developing and developing Art and Living, which is in Lauriston, a, a 10 year art strategy for Lauriston in the south of Glasgow. Um, so what we're gonna, we're gonna cover uh, is three main areas today. We're gonna try and make it as conversational as possible, so there'll be a fluidity to the discussions. And the first of those, which I'll direct probably first to Graham, is just to talk to us a little bit about the trends in urban design and creative placemaking um, and the kind of role of arts and culture uh, and festivity in that period pro, uh, sorry, pre-COVID. Um, and then I'll go on and, and Peter will, will join that part of the conversation. So Graham, would you like to take us first? Sure. So, I mean, in response to, I suppose, the trends uh, in creative placemaking, I mean, the last uh, two decades uh, in the UK and further afield, I suppose, has seen a, um, a renaissance in, um, an and an appreciation of urbanism. Um, the to uh, Towards an Urban Renaissance report uh, in the late 1990s, I think, was one of the kind of pivot points. Uh, and in the last two decades, there has been a, a greater appreciation of the interconnectedness of the um, quality of life and the relationship between place and um, community and the activities and uh, I suppose the facets of local uh, and civic uh, health within uh, communities. And so I suppose urban design planning, um, urbanism more generally has been grappling with a, a range of issues which um, have pointed towards uh, uh, the aspect of community uh, empowerment or and community participation uh, and influence in shaping uh, um, communities' own place. Um, I suppose there's been a significant uh, move towards uh, an appreciation of how to uh, try and create uh, planning processes that are participative, that are inclusive, um, that reflect the diversity of the communities and the physical environment within which uh, we're working. And clearly, of course, there's been a, a, over that last couple of decades a heightened urgency with respect to the climate change agenda and uh, what that means both physically and uh, for society more generally. So that's, you know, faced into issues of how we get um, about and uh, to our um, urban places, um, the quality of green space, the, the, the role that uh, green space has with respect to creating a healthy environment, uh, an environment which maybe grapples with some of those issues of inequality, be they socioeconomic, uh, health or, or otherwise, and generally a trend uh, towards um, reflecting on what makes a good place, um, both with respect to the diversity and mix of uses, the ability to access um, uh, the basic needs and the enhanced needs of um, 
uh, living in a, a good environment. And I suppose, therefore, the, kind of the, the notion of the 20-minute neighbourhood, um, which has, again, recently been, uh, um, come to the fore, is something that a lot of people have been talking about. And underpinning all of that, as I say earlier on, has always been a, a, a clearer sense of the role that communities, in every sense of that word, be it resident communities, business communities, cultural communities, civic communities, that have an interest and a stake and a sense of ownership for a place, how they are therefore empowered um, to engage and participate and shape and influence and indeed deliver change in their um, local area, in their locale, is I think something that's been uh, fundamental to recent urban practice. And therefore, I suppose the, the work that I've been involved in, collaborating with Peter and colleagues over the last 10, 12 years or thereby, has been trying to explore different tools and techniques and ways to undertake creative placemaking that engages um, the usual and the unusual suspects trying to get as broad a constituency and mandate um, as possible and build up the broader will within a local community to make the changes and transformations that they feel are, are important. So, so I would say, as, uh, as I've maybe um, uh, to throw that the point one last time, I think that the, the, the involvement of a kind of community-led participatory planning has been one of the um, the, the real centre points of a broader awareness and appreciation of the importance of placemaking in terms of how that uh, ensures that individually and collectively we live healthier, more fulfilling uh, lives and enjoy an enhanced quality of life. I think that the Scottish Government and a number of their agencies, including Architecture and Design Scotland and others, um, should be applauded for um, promoting good practice and uh, raising awareness of the, you know, a place-based approach. And, you know, when you reflect on, as I say, that last couple of decades, I mean, um, only recently the Scottish Government adopted what they refer to as the place principle. And that recognises that that rootedness of a place-based approach to whether it's public sector investment or action or activity um, is, uh, you know, fundamental to good governance of our communities and so um, not disaggregating the sense of community place and the activity uh, be it economic or otherwise that occurs um, uh, in that setting but understanding as Padre Geddes the Scots polymath always told us that folk work and place interconnected is the, the, the basis upon which we understand how our villages towns cities and the communities that um, uh, occupy them you know, that symbiotic, symbiotic and reciprocal and interconnected relationship between the, the community, the physical environment and the activity, economic and otherwise, that occurs there, that therefore becomes the culture of the place of the community. Um, so when you reflect therefore on um, a, a range of Scottish planning policy um, initiatives, not least the Design Charette programme that you referred to in the introduction, where again Peter and I um, collaborated regularly working with um, both inner city and um, historic royal borough and um, uh, different communities and um, post-industrial communities grappling with um, issues that were unique to the place but shared in terms of the broader societal um, issues of as I say climate change uh, and inequalities and all the rest. I think that the Scottish Government's initiatives with design sheets, with the place principle and with um, promoting that awareness of a place-based approach uh, has positioned Scotland very well in the last uh, decade and more uh, to you know, make sure that's central to not only public policy, but also the, the, the practice of working with communities to shape their future. Yeah. And, and Peter, what, what role for art and, and, and culture-based interventions within these processes that, that Graham has described? Well, I think, you know, Graham used that word disaggregation, and I think it's it's a really interesting one to mull over in that idea of being an interconnector or a kind of weaver or a kind of remaker of kind of uh, ideas of place, uh, ideas of relationship, um, opportunities for us indeed to connect to ourselves. You know, I think that's one of the things that uh, we often forget when we list all the things that generate alienation. We forget the way that, as the situationists used to describe it, you know, we become colonized in the inside. 
you know, we become alienated from our very selves, from our sort of, you know, range of feelings and abilities. And I always think of the inner city um, underpass with this one blinking light and its pristine corner is a perfect example of a kind of place where one becomes alienated from oneself, you know, rather than have a fully embodied journey through that place, you kind of withdraw, you disaggregate from your own range of senses and you just drive through uh, as quickly as possible to get to somewhere else. And that, that kind of sense of kind of going places and from places and to places, not quite as yourself, but as some kind of automaton or kind of half version of yourself, I think is, is one of the most fundamental types of alienation that can happen, particularly within inner city design, which as we know is so disposed and driven by the motor car, you know, which must be one of the you know, great tools of modern alienation. And uh, so I think that the role of being an interconnector or a kind of, you know, weaver is really interesting. And it's a great privilege. Uh, I should say when Graham says that we work together, that's very true. And we work very closely together with a great sense of known hierarchical kind of sharing of information. But I am reliant upon Graham for those initiatives for he's the one who builds the teams. And he's the one who consistently over a long period of time, maybe, Graham, I don't know, 15, 16 years anyway, has continually seen the value of bringing in on board artists and indeed, you know, ethnographers, historians and others, which I think is very wise. I think it's, um, I often sort of think that to counteract the speed at which we need to do things these days, the speed of which we need to fix things and climate change would be maybe the top of the list there. But, you know, the impossible speed that is required of us to work, uh, you know, uh, when we don't have time, at least we can work in that ac access that is kind of multi-layered thinking. So the widest possible range of team members to bring to, so that we together as a team are, are connected and connecting to all those different aspects of ourselves and of society. And then we can begin to think about how to draw in the widest possible conversations into the process. So that all those people who are at the very least expert in their own lives and who are more than likely expert in all sorts of other things as well, can that their knowledge really can be kind of woven into the process. And I think that is Scottish government's vision largely. So in the tools that Graham has mentioned, and the other ones, you know, the charrette process that, that you mentioned in my introduction is to, you know, is it's really common sense to say, rather than a hierarch hierarchically driven design and planning process, to have one which is distributed and rhizomic and kind of draws from what's brilliant about the individual, what's deeply and uniquely held by that individual and how you bring that into small groups and larger groups and some sense of collective whole, you know with the idea that, that that collective whole is always an illusion, just as the word public is a, is, a, is a trap that we fall into as though we could ever represent ourselves, even, even that I might ever be able to represent myself in any kind of you know, definition. Language itself, of course, as you well know, David, is at the heart of all of this. And I think we have to continually negotiate the terms round. I, for example, try never to use the word regeneration unless I'm, t I'm, I'm flagging it up as a pejorative term or a term that has become contentious these days. Even place making, uh, we've grappled with terms around place mending, place making, you know, uh, participative practices, socially engaged practices. It's important that we try and continually avoid the cliches and get to something that is meaningful, but that's always like everything else, I think there's an event nature to the language itself, you know, where the, the meaning is fleeting and it's always slipping away and we're always in danger. And I think the problem with those people who work on a grassroots level that I would class myself and Graham as, as working on is that, you know, you, you try and bring that experience back into the kind of the policy and the planning processes and the governmental structures. By the time you've managed to do that, things have moved again. As we've seen at the minute, you know, your, your conversation today is structured around these three things, pre-COVID, COVID and post-COVID, you know, because you're quite right. We absolutely have to say, 
just as we're trying to pin it down, this first meeting we were going to convene was pre-COVID. We're now in the middle of COVID and we're not really sure if there's going to be a post-COVID. So it's kind of, you know, we have to rethink again. Yeah. Uh, really interesting. In the context of the work that you've both, both done, um, it seems to me one of the big issues is about ownership of these processes of design or placemaking or mending or whatever. How do you go about or how have you gone about kind of you know, getting that issue of ownership with communities? Diverse communities often and often in a case where perhaps a, a local authority or government or whatever want something to happen in that area. You know, they want to regenerate that area. So how do you as you approach your practice go about kind of ensuring that ownership resides with the people who live and have, have a, live in that place and also how is that sustainable? So, you know, I know we've had discussions before about kind of activating spaces and maybe making spaces really nice and pretty and useful, but then there's maybe no programming, for example, to continue that afterwards. And so the place dies or becomes dead because it's not invested in in that way. So how would you explore some of those themes? Well, I'll start on that one, maybe, because yeah. I think, in a way, Graham's answer to that is, Graham, uh, uh, alongside all those other team members, but Graham... Oh, almost always makes a, a place for us on his teams to lead on that particular aspect, you know, to lead because, uh, because of the area of expertise that myself and the team that I lead hold. And I think our technical expert, expertise is hard to pin down. It's probably just that I'm really interested in other human beings and genuinely interested and continually distracted by them and their lives and the things that are important to them. And um, so Graham brings us in to kind of be a front line, if you like, to connect in processes which will have a strategic element, which will have complex and slow processes with regard to planning and policy. But we go in to sort of be immediately on the ground and often to convince people who believe they have nothing to say and nothing to contribute that actually they do. And that's why, you know, I, I return to the theme of cultural hijack from time to time, because we, we go in, we do not go in with kind of, uh, you know, uh, questionnaires and uh, in the conventional sense on little boards and kind of pens that fill them in. We often go in with an idea of hijack to lure people into a conversation with the process that really they don't have time for or have any interest in. So we would conventionally go to the places where people wait, where they're bored, or where we might kind of distract them into some kind of relationship with themselves and with the process that we really know that they will be interested in. Of course, another cornerstone of that is to go to the people who are deeply interested and who are very clear, the, the conventional stakeholders. And again, I don't really like that idea because by its very kind of classification status, it suggests that some people aren't stakeholders. And I, and I think everybody, of course, is. But, you know, those people who know that they have something to say and have a voice are another important cornerstone. And, and Graham and I team tag those kind of meetings together. But the people who turn up to those meetings and to the meeting in the village hall are often not the people who we get along to the process by other tactics. And we're really brazen about using the full range of our creativity to get those people into the room. And that's the start of an answer to your question, because to get a sense of ownership, you really have to begin by sort of drawing people into a relationship. And you cannot blame people for being feeling that they've been consulted to death, for feeling that they've been consulted and then ignored, for feeling that many of these processes are kind of token gestures. Ownership is a massive theme, and, but I think that, and maybe Graham might touch on your second part of your question, which is the, the, it's one thing, and I think we're very good and very successful at generating the initial contact because we see it as, we see the requirement to be extraordinarily creative about that. And that's one of our areas of constant invention. So we don't just assume we put up a poster or put out a questionnaire and that people turn up because they don't. And, uh, but the second part is even more difficult. Once you have managed by hook or by crook to get people there, how do you sustain that? And how do you make that a genuine process? How does it go from peak and interest to eliciting those first responses to actually sustaining that and, and getting that so that when processes emerge and they often take, as you know, three years, five years, 10 years, how do you kind of, how do you ensure that kind of community organizations and individuals stay on board, have the capacity and the energy to sustain themselves to retain ownership 
of, of that. And that's a, I think like the other questions you're asking, David, that is a, we have, Graham and I have, together with all the teams we work with, we've had developed some brilliant tools around that, but we don't really feel that we've got, you know, on the next project, we have to start again. We have to continually reinvent that and find new bespoke solutions to that. But Graham, I don't know if you have anything to add to that in terms of... Um, well, I mean, in terms of the, the, the ownership issue, I suppose you know, the work that you referred to, Peter, and the kind of art of conversation that you know, you're an expert exponent of yourself, I think that that um, initial um, in, engagement encounter be it through the, the process of hijack or community animation or some other um, tool or technique that uh, we or others have used uh, in the past is a route into, I suppose, in the first instance, providing a, you know, a validity and a platform for anybody who engages in that process to feel that they've got an opportunity to influence and to impart knowledge. Because oftentimes you're encountering a deep-seated cynicism or scepticism, as Peter's outlined, be it that things, oh, well, we spoke to so-and-so two years ago and nothing happened, or, you know, you're not from here, so what would you know about my place, or whatever it happens to be. To get beyond that culture of complaint, to get beyond the, well, the council or whoever it else happens to be doesn't do X or Y and Z, and start to then get, flip that on its head into a, a, a position of um, owning the problem and owning the solution to that problem, developing a remedy together, um, and getting beyond us. Peter refers to that culture of complaint is really that, to my mind, having gone through the process numerous times, that's the first step in starting to get to a point where the you know ownership going forward is about owning the solution to a, a shared problem rather than expecting that you identify the issue and expect somebody else to deal with it. Sustaining that and continuing that and delivering that so that actually affects change in the long term is massively challenging. And I suppose one of the frustrations that Peter and I often have about the type of work that we are commissioned to do is that it tends to be in the overall time frame of delivering transformation in any place, a reasonably fleeting moment in time at an early point in the process that maybe sets the parameters for something to occur. But I suppose as ar ar architects and, and artists, we do from time to time have the, um, the privilege of seeing the in the project through to completion to delivery and physical manifestation. But that in itself is only not even half of the story because as you said earlier on, David, it's then about how that physical intervention or other intervention is then actually adopted and adapted by the local community going forward. So we have had, and Pete and I could share various anecdotes on successes of instances where individuals or groups have been inspired by or empowered by the work that we've uh, undertaken in collaboration with them to the point where we've maybe helped to restore a community council or um, inspired uh, an individual to become a local uh, to stand for election become a local councillor through to you know um, helping communities or groups to make a change or to sustain a change in their local area which is great but equally we could point to um, probably many times more the number of instances of false dawns of you know, uh, projects that started but never um, fully delivered on the promise. And that, of course, is human nature. It's the nature of um, the challenge of, of making change in any sphere. But um, I do think building that capacity and wherewithal does require a sustained effort, not just necessarily the, uh, the input that we may be able to impart in a, in, in a charity process, for instance, which is a short, sharp, participative, um, experience, one which is still in itself very valid, and one which Peter would, you know, remind me is an event in and of itself, and becomes yes. part of the, the the making of positive new memories and changing perceptions of what's possible. So that, in its own right, can um, start to um, give people a sense of a, of owning their future and owning some degree of influence to make that happen, and indeed to be part of the change. So. Um, I can think of, in terms of the uh, examples that Peter and I have been involved in, instances where we bring in perhaps experts who know a lot about um, uh, traffic and transportation, and urban mobility, or they might know a lot about um, different facets of uh, property and uh, development and so on and so forth, and bringing that, that deep expertise uh, into play with um, 
non-experts within our local community and then trying to explore ways to um, um, establish what should happen, prioritise, develop a, you know, a, a way to deliver change and try and broker new partnerships and make introductions and new networks so that you've got more than a fighting chance of success, yeah. that becomes really, really important. And Graham, the just, I mean, I think the thing that's really extraordinary about this process is that at its best, it, uh, it takes everything that's extraordinary about event nature activity. You think about an, uh, an epiphany in a festival or reading a particular line in a book that changes your life. We should never discount the possibility for those momentary epiphanies. You know, we all are the people that we are because of that line in that song or that book that we read or that person that we bumped into. So those moments of serendipity, happenstance and epiphany that kind of are very hard to quantify in terms of value systems. We encounter that a lot in these rooms in which we go into. They are incredibly, they're so full of people's aspiration. It's so moving when people turn up uh, really invested in the place they live, really seeing an opportunity to make a difference for them their parents, their children, and, and these are extraordinary uh, experiences. And as, I, as Graham said, in and of themselves, they're almost the best part of the whole process. And they should be seen as being very much a thing in their own right. What better thing could you have than a community come together to talk about its history and its future in that Geddes kind of tradition? They are extraordinary. But when you can, in addition to that, actually consolidate that in physical built form, so that people not only have their epiphany, but they're encountering it and remembering it and thinking, we made this happen. That's the kind of beautiful double bind of that kind of relationship. And that's the prize that is at stake. And I think when you can make that happen, it's really, you really feel, this is extraordinary. This is the best of event-based processes and the best of kind of permanent-based processes. The only problem is that you generate in these processes so many more ideas than those that you can actually resource or pay tribute to, which has led us often to wonder about and think about together the idea of the ideas bank as a thing in its own right, or the thing that is the process that is the prototype or the idea of the work alongside the work itself. Because if there are ways that kind of you can hold and present those things that they still they, they haven't manifested themselves as full scale permanent things, but they also are significant as ideas that should have a residue and should it be permanent. And I think it's something along the lines of that that led us to the idea of the outdoor museum in Helensburg, for example, which is both a permanent residue but is also an empty space, uh, like the fourth plinth in Trafalgar, where there are more empty plinths than there are plinths of objects. So it speaks about its own future of something that will become full over maybe 120 years. And it was a really delightful project for the, the, all those, the, the moment of these openings, when people turn up to see you know, their voice, their story, their object, you know, reified in the way something might be in a museum or a gallery but it's an outdoor space. Those are, and those aren't expensive or, you know, th that's a very small part of the overall process, um, which kind of, yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. The, I mean the, the work that you do, Peter, um, celebrates that event nature of a place, of an environment, you know, and I've been lucky enough to work with other artists who similarly, whether it was George Wiley or others, you know, the, the event based nature of the, the moment in, uh, you know, in space and a point in time, uh, it was absolutely crucial. But I think the other aspect is that, you know, Peter and I have been lucky enough to collaborate with uh, in the likes of MVRDV and Winnie Mass, and Winnie talks about the city never being finished. Yeah. And the city itself is an event. There's a perpetual change, yeah. and that, um, you know, other um, triplet of Geddes of past, present, and possible is one that Peter and I use as a framework when in, uh, discussing um, with communities, because invariably there's often a, you encounter a sense of, well, things don't change around here or things have been the same forever. And then when you reflect on actually the immediate past in the last 5, 10, 15 years, as well as the long and barely remembered past and that shared in collective memory, you do get a sense of the continuous of continual change, that perpetual shifting and adjustment. And it then starts to frame a discussion in terms of diagnosing, well, what are the issues here in the, the here and now in the present? And then start to discuss collectively about what the priorities are for that possible future. And that becomes a, a really powerful sense of, of 
you know, that perpetual change and shift and the place, whether it's a town, village or city, being an event in and of itself. And, and, and that, that was like a, a well-developed um, uh, segue into the, the, the context of pandemic and COVID. So the, the possible, the, the, the past, present and possible, you know, the disruption that we've seen. So the idea of a, a city as an event, I mean, is that there's not a bigger disruption, I guess, to that sense than what we've experienced over the last few months. So how in the space of urban design and the space of creative placemaking, do you respond to the fact that people find it more difficult to gather in the way that they did, where they had those interactions that you were mentioning, Peter, those epiphany moments with other people interacting, sharing spaces, encountering each other. How do you design this into the, uh, the period that we're experiencing at the moment? It's a, I mean, I think that's a, it's a big question and I really enjoyed looking at your conference that you've recently put up online and some of the range of ideas that are coming in from other cities, you know, uh, vacation streets and some of those brilliant projects that were mentioned. Uh, I think that first and form foremostly, we have to ask the question, just as you've asked it, David, in the, to the broadest range of people uh, in the, uh, and in the most open way as possible to look to our, you know, our mothers of six, our janitors of buildings, our anthropologists and professional, you know, soldiers, and to, to really draw ideas and be inventive from every possible place we might. I myself been drawn a lot back to philosophy to think about, you know, because I, I, like everybody else, I find myself slightly retiring from my own life, you know, sort of moving back into a quieter space of reflection. And I'm not really a quiet person at all, you know, quite a garrulous. I love the company of other people, but I find another gear. And then to find, you know, I, I think I... I I'm a bit concerned about myself in that regard of kind of that idea of retiring from that previous life. And I can see so many of my friends doing the same. So I think we need to demand of ourselves uh, sort of new ideas about how we convene. And, you know, we've all been Zoom to death and Microsoft team to death. And, you know, some of the ideas from your conference and ones I'd concur with are about half embodied processes of being partly present and partly virtual. And I think those are interesting. Um, I think that the language is problematic and I, and I think that we can't say it often enough, you know, social distancing is a terrible term. Uh, it, it, what we require is physical distancing to be safe from the virus and social engagement. And social engagement that's better than it's ever been before because the physical distancing by itself creates an, another layer of alienation that we've previously experienced and known through other types of city design. So it's a bit like, you know, you know, COVID itself has brought this new layer of alienation and we really need to pierce through it and think about how to be resourceful within it. And I think that, again, as I said before, with regard to what's so brilliant about the process that Graham invites me to contribute to, it is about ideas and concepts and kind of these individual kind of exchanges. And then it's to think about, well, what potential for the actual rolled out, designed, permanent, or ever-changing, temporary, physical space. And I think some of those initiatives that we've seen already, some of the ways that people have designed physical space to work for concerts or gardens or parks, spaces, those are all good. And, the, the, you know, Graham and I together have collected a bank of those ideas. And we have the, the amazing opportunity through the DRF that's, that we're working with at the minute with a wide team of others to actually make recommendation for some of those changes. But at the heart of that, and I've offered it several times as a provocation to our team, is the process itself. And this is where Graham and I may be in some level of disagreement. The process itself is still predicated on council processes and strategic budgeting that is strategic. And there is a big question to say, uh, you know, given the option between strategy, strategy being too long term and taking too long and becoming redundant because of how fast things change now, and tactics being too precarious because they're not allied to anything that has much substance in terms of next week or a year's time, and the need for something in between that you might call tactic tack, where do we, in a process like the DRF, where do we place our budget? Where do we place our energy? Where do we place our focus? And I think from 
Graham, who leads our team and is kind of really the person as much as anybody who holds a strategic overview of what we need to achieve and everything else, is, you know, I'm continue to feel like there's a bit of a challenge I have to put to Graham and the rest of the team with regard to say, what kind of recommendation report are we aiming at in terms of the time scale and in terms of the major uh, emerging? Uh, and we've been having this debate as we, well, as we went through. So when we started discussing this in March, at the very onset of the first lockdown, we were all anticipating that we'd be out of it by now. And I think now we're in a different conversation. And I think we have to continually review the processes by which we plan things. So it's not sidestepping all the detail that you want to get to, David, but I think it's probably a really important question about what the target is of a DRF. And I think it's, uh, and I do offer that as um, not everybody on our team thinks the same way or places the emphasis on that. And I think Graham is still beholden to what he knows are the mechanisms of the council that can't maybe change fast enough to be in the situation that we're actually in. So Graham, I, I kind of offer that to you as a bit of a provocation. Uh, no, I mean, I, 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 I mean, straightforwardly, I, I completely concur. I mean, I think that the, the pandemic is demanding a degree of improvisation, you know, a tactical response to uh, you know, a global and shared challenge. Um, and given as ever, you know, in a response to crisis, it sometimes supercharges and fast tracks things that should have been happening anyway but also present some significant and you know, scary challenges, which of course there is a tendency for folk to fixate on the negative and um, perhaps lose sight of the, the need for it to be resolute and also to continue to hold um, hope for the long term. So, I mean, the first thing I would say is that, you know, as human beings, we're a social animal. You know, we enjoy company, we enjoy being physically present, um, not, you know, absolutely not socially distant. And some of those shared experiences, cultural experiences, um, you know, whether they are um, with respect to the informality of urban uh, living, the day-to-day, -day, everyday city, or whether they're the, the special and occasional and the remarkable, um, whether it's large or small scale events, that's, they, they, these, that becomes the individual me memory resource that then starts to populate the kind of psychic realm, the cognitive map of the city and of those memories. And of course, that has become massively miniaturized as again, to use the word, we've disaggregated as a society and we've then um, withdrawn to our spare rooms or our kitchen tables to have conversations such as this. But what it has also meant is that I think many people have relearned or discovered anew that two mile um, space around the place in which they live. Absolutely. So I do suspect that in the deep lockdown of spring 2020, all of us will have walked down streets and nooks and crannies of our neighbourhoods and our uh, districts that we'd never previously been to, however long we'd lived in that area. And so that sense of rediscovery of our places and reconnection with the physical place, I think is powerful. And of course, there was the global sense of a shared challenge a shared experience where we were all um, coerced and required to lock down and stay at home. And then that uh, an immediate human reaction to then want to have a shared sense of togetherness. And so of course, I think we all probably experienced for the first time in a long time, a sense of camaraderie, of rapport, um, of empathy with one another when you were walking about your local streets and having a nod and a wink and a hello to folk that you'd never seen before or since. And I think you start to get a kind of sense of, actually, this is, um, in many respects, demanding that we reconnect or reappraise what's important to us and to, our, to ourselves. Of course, what it has also meant uh, is that um, in that massive shift, in that disaggregation and that change in which we engage with, the, um, with our lo local place, it has meant that we've become far less mobile We've been far more rooted and local, and therefore there are certain parts of our cities, Glasgow City Centre in, in our case, when we're talking about the DRF's district regeneration frameworks, where the, the, the purpose and the, um, the challenge facing the city centres, therefore, well, how can we enliven that? Because in Glasgow City Centre's case, 
it was enlivened by 135,000 folk commuting to work there, or 60 or 70,000 folk on a Friday or a Saturday night going to uh, enjoy a recreational experience, whether it was high or low culture. And that demanded transit, it demanded um, a, a, a transition from daytime to nighttime economy and so on and so forth, which has been completely stymied by this disaggregation of society. So of course there is then panic in terms of this has a massive structural implications for the conventional wisdom and the, um, the known economy and the way of doing things that we experienced up to early March 2020. And I think we've got to hold our nerve because I think we've got to, we've got to hold on to some timeless truisms in terms of what makes community and life worth living and enjoying, um, that sense of sharing, that sense of uh, coming together, that sense of um, uh, being together. And I do think that we have to hold on to the hope that um, whether it's through different antiviral treatments or a vaccine or just a different attitude to how we deal with this, we will come out the other end. And if we can hold on to some of those positive aspects that Lord knows it's hard sometimes to hold on to them, but if we can be resolute in that respect, but also not um, lose sight of the prize in terms of some of the things that have been um, uh, encouraged or uh, um, enabled uh, or acted as a catalyst through this COVID experience. So for instance, the, the move away from um, certain modes of traf transport to doing more walking and cycling is very positive. But of course, there's also that significant challenge of the tendency to further disaggregate back into private motor cars and not into that shared resource of, for instance, public transport. So huge challenges, massive issues with respect to the culture of the place and that event nature of the place, because in certain parts of the city, that's almost been switched off entirely. And um, so I completely understand why people are anxious, concerned, worried, livelihoods are at stake. Um, all of our health, uh, uh, health is at stake of ourselves and our families. But I do think that we have to hold out hope and optimism and hold on to some of those important lessons that we've learned from the past in terms of what makes a good place and try and make sure that we don't lose sight of that going forward. And in the meantime, to pick up on Peter's proposition, I think we've got to improvise well. We've got to hold on to um, trying to do some of these tactical interventions with a sense of panache, with a sense of joy, with a sense of optimism and uh, with a sense of colour and bring back that, um, you know, celebrate the, the, um, the sense of encouraging people to do more walking and cycling, which actually is something that transforms that experience rather than feeling like you're um, going through some sort of a kind of temporary road work scenario um, in the city centre to actually something that you think, well, hold on a minute, this has completely transformed my outlook in terms of how the city can be uh, in the future and let's make damn sure that we hold on to those good things and we make sure that they become permanent in the long term. Is there a, just, just kind of coming to the end, is there, is there a sense of that improvisation? Is there a, is there a way that, that that city leaders need to cede control, a little bit more control of, of how the city looks and is? So they, it felt to me that during the early parts of the pandemic and at other points that there was quite a lot of improvisation and spontaneity by communities, neighbourhoods, at, at, for example, hosting their own festivities, making them happen in the streets that were now available to be used rather than closed off or, or seen as being regulated in that way. Is there a way that we can design that in, that we can ensure that people have more scope to use their local environments to host things that do provide that sort of gathering? I mean, I was at the Govan Hill International Festival in Carnival recently, where they had a street music festival that happened across Govan Hill out of people's windows, outside of little civic spaces that were there, like commonly used little garden spaces. Uh, mm -hmm. And there were, it was socially distanced. People were enjoying being around. The businesses were having some benefit in respect of that kind of idea of traffic being directed towards them. That, that happened without, you know, uh, without too many problems, without over too much regulation around about it. Is there a way we can do something with the existing cities that we have spaces to to enable more of that that control for local populations? I think there was a there was a point that came from your conference, and I don't know the, the example you've just mentioned sounds brilliant. I didn't get to encounter that, but I was at the harvest event last night at SWG three, which is the first public gathering of an event I've been at, and it ran very successfully. The SWG three team were really together. Angus Farker's project was. Uh, 
was run. It was about growing food and then sharing it in the form of chips at a big event. And it was, it was, you know, it just showed to us all. It was really great to be out together and to realize that that can work. And I think um, we need to resource those, those works as prototypes. And I think, which is very relevant to the research that you and your team are doing, David, we need to ask the question of those prototypes. How do they, how do they lead? How do we see those as prototypes for how the space itself changes? Because there's the infrastructure in terms of policy. And I think that's the cumbersome stuff often to change. Regulations around street closures and traffic movement and all that. We need to get that to be as light as possible so that a sort of really inventive approach to prototyping allows us to host those events. But I think we need teams like yourselves to come in the back of those events and then say, okay, other way round, rather than designing the civic square for the events that might happen in them, take the event and then re rearrange the physical space around that. So we start to draw knowledge from those events. So we see those events, we should see them. And I think it might help with the mindset if we saw those events were evolving our cityscapes and our economic patterns for the future. Then we would invest in them, we would make them easy to happen, we would give them the kind of caveated blessing that you can give a rerouting of traffic lights when you want to do a traffic survey. You can click your fingers and you can make the traffic work in a different way around a city centre for, you know, with very, with a very little bureaucracy. But if you try and do that for a street festival, it's very, very bureaucratic. So I think there's a mindset change that happens where we see, and I think you're the perfect person actually, through your team to lead this conversation further is, how do you do that the other way around? How do those events inform that kind of change? And I guess that in a way is the work that Graham and I have done a lot through the charrette processes. You know, it's a type of prototyping, then feeding back into more strategic documents, the knowledge that's come from, you know, we've, we've run a lot of outdoor cinemas, uh, temporary outdoor cinemas as part of the way that we relay the people that we speak to. You know, what do you do with their voice once you've spoken to them? Well, we show it back to them. Uh, you know, in High Street, we had an event where we had literally the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker, and every other business that at the time was on the street. We, we spoke to them and then we, we, we built a film around that and then we screamed it on the street as outdoor cinema. So it's kind of, it's allowing the, those one-off events to say, okay, we need to close this street. We need to make that really easy to do on a weekly basis. And I think as, as we come back to language as always, between the, the momentary epiphany and the long-term change is all of that resource in between of the temporarily permanent or the permanently temporary or all the kind of, I don't like the word pop-up because it is apolitical and anodyne. And it's used too often by kind of young architects to step in for what, um, you know, revolutionary activists would have called intervention. But, you know, um, having said that, somebody's just popped in through your door to intervene. <laughs> it's probably time up. <laughs> well, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll have final, a go. Final I'll, word, respond, yeah. I'll respond to that point as well. Um, if you look at the work that we published with respect to the, the district regeneration frameworks under the Your Our City Centre project that Peter and I have been involved in. Long before the COVID, uh, and it wasn't unique to us, and others were promoting it as well, was this um, commitment to uh, being far more agile and promoting the prototyping approach that uh, Peter refers to. And, you know, guess what? I mean, you know, the COVID situation has just demonstrated that that's precisely you know, that has a, you know, a validity and an importance to it. I mean, if we've, in the last 25 weeks, gone through, you know, 25 years of change or transformation in some respects in terms of practice, well, yeah, that's required a degree of improvisation. But there's been a, well, you've seen it in, in almost every facet of public life. There's been a degree of agility and improvisation that one would have never believed was possible, whether it's at a national level or a, or, or a local level. And that um, sense of a hands-on or a hands-off approach that dichotomy of hands-on and hands-off with respect to policy and regulation and enforcement persists in every facet of the work that we do. And it was a, it was a, a challenge pre-COVID, it'll be a challenge uh, uh, beyond COVID. But I mean, we sometimes have talked in the work that we've been doing in Glasgow and elsewhere, uh, when, we, when we encounter an issue 
whether it's um, a local business wanting to do something or a community group wanting to you know, host an event or a business wanting to try um, and uh, do something a different way. Whenever they encounter regulation, they should be encountering a situation of a presumptive yes. Not here's the, book, here's, not here's the Bible of why things can't happen. How can we make this happen? And what are the things that we need to adjust? And uh, I mean, and sometimes that is an issue of a change in mindset, a relaxation in policy, uh, a degree of uh, um, a prototyping. And we've spoken long uh, and hard and oftentimes about the power and the um, purpose that, for instance, um, temporary traffic regulation orders, the kind of try before you buy, let's close this street for um, a weekend for an event or for an activity and let's see if the city can adapt and guess what it can. So of course you can do your traffic modelling and you can uh, you know, uh, check various indices. If you actually trial it, you test it, you, you, know, you, you undertake the event, you, you monitor and observe the event, you the proof of concept, you demonstrate that um, it uh, had you know, unintended and beneficial consequences, even better. Um, and sometimes that's enabled us, as we did in the Helmsborough project, to um, you know, address some of the issues the naysayers were coming up with, identify issues and tweaks and adjustments that needed to be made to make it work, and then to be able to make that temporary measure a more permanent measure. And in Helmsborough was a case in point where we went from a, an urban space, which you know, the amount of red tape that you had to go through was phenomenal. And we you know, uh, looked at it on the basis of how can we take that red tape space and turn it into a green tape space? How can we remove through design, integrated design and adjustments in policy and a change in mindset, how can we enable a situation where you don't have to spend 1,400 quid for a road closure, you don't have to complete uh, 13 different forms to achieve that um, temporary um, circumstance to allow you to have the event? How can we redesign the space so that those 13 forms just became one. There is no cost because you've already got a, you know, a, a series of uh, closures in place and you enable and provide that platform that then allows, that then becomes the canvas upon which the local community then have the challenge of, well, can we um, create, can we occupy, can we program this space to enliven it with the types of events that we've, we've said long and often that we want to have? And it happened. And I think that's where you go through that shift from prototyping and testing and trialing to then getting to a point where policy and the physical environment is organized in such a way that you're able to be more agile, more responsive, easier to improvise, and you just provide a, a mindset for change. But the one thing I would also guard against is that there are certain times where you take your hands off in terms of regulation and policy. There are other times where I still think it's absolutely vital that we make sure that we regulate properly and accurately where it's important. So whether it's in terms of design quality and the quality of the environment that we're creating, we'll never diminish the quality of what we're trying to do. Never have a circumstance of the kind of that'll do, that, you know, attitude. I know that might be okay, Peter, in terms of, you know, installation or event activity, and George Wiley would tell us. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, in, yeah. but in terms of um, the more permanent change that we make to our cities, like, you know, let's not uh, lower the bar in terms of the quality of the public environment, the streetscape, the buildings, um, and let's ensure that what we do do when it is a longer term intervention is done with that durability, that timelessness, and uh, you know, an enduring quality. So, um, long way of saying that long before COVID, we've been talking about that polarity of the hands off, hands on intervention or non intervention to making things happen. But I think that mindset of the presumptive yes, the yes, we can do this, or how can we do this, um, it should be the default when we encounter people coming forward with a bright idea and then say, okay, let's do it, let's make it happen. Okay, um, great point at which to, to finish. Um, I want to thank you both for the time that you've given up. Um, it was a really fascinating discussion, one I think we can continue, uh, maybe in a future CCSE conversation.